I mean, I don't know if anybody's still gonna show up late, but that's their problem, I suppose. Yeah, okay, so uh, let's uh, have a look today at uh, a high level overview of uh, coroutines. Um, I won't go into particular detail about anything, but uh, we will have, uh, we'll be able to look uh, a bit at uh, what they are. Um, you might hear quite a few definitions of what they are, depending on where you read or what language you're using. Uh, we're gonna look at where we have them, uh, as in what languages, uh, what contexts, uh, when they are useful, so what problems do they solve and where it doesn't make sense to use them. And uh, if we make room for it, then also a little bit like how, how, do, we, how do we use them? So that will probably be a little bit of an example, uh, but uh, we will see. Maybe we can replace it with a discussion instead, but I will try to at least encourage a discussion as we move through this as well. Let me open the chat for that. Yeah, I suppose it doesn't block anything important. Okay, so uh, for definitions, uh, a lot of places you will see lightweight threads. Uh, while that doesn't really say very much, uh, in a way you can say that it's true. Uh, but we're gonna look at a couple of others as well. So we have uh, cooperative scheduling, uh, as in coroutines as opposed to uh, threads, they are a lot more cooperative with, it, with each other since they, will themselves personally say i will yield to you so uh, we will look at uh, what that means and they're also scheduled since they they run concurrently so they have to somehow be scheduled to run on your cpu and they're cooperative uh, because uh, they say hey i i'm waiting for something uh, i'm experiencing i want to yield to you so uh, that's the next point. So you could say that there are tasks that can yield. So for example, if you're making a network call to a database or an API, uh, while you're waiting for the response, it makes no sense for that uh, process to be like, I'm just gonna idle here and wait for the re response. So instead it will say, I will yield and then another task. Um, so it's cooperative because I, it says I, I will yield to you now because I have nothing to do. And so it cooperates with other tasks that are running uh, concurrently, but not in parallel. Uh, they can be used in a way that you think of uh, like async first programming. So network calls is a very good example for this again. Uh, since they happen asynchronously, you will make a request and then at some point in the future, you get a response. So if you're making like 10 requests, um, instead of having them run synchronously, like you do one request, then you wait for the response, and then you get the response and process it. You will send one response, no, sorry, one request, and then the coroutine will yield, um, allowing another one to run, which will send the request. And then all after all 10 maybe have sent the requests, the responses will start, start taking in and like they will be resumed where they left off. So that's another way to think about it, tasks that can yield and then resume where they left off. And instead of tasks, you can replace that with functions. Uh, so you can think of them as functions that can suspend their execution before finishing. So if you have a function uh, with, uh, say there's an if statement and then a, a loop afterwards, you can have this function sort of stop executing in the middle of this if statement allow someone else to run their code and then keep going from where it left off. So, and that's also the part of the yielding. So when it stops executing that function, it yields so another function can run or task, depending on how you look at it. And that takes it also back to the cooperativeness of the, of the coroutines, uh, which also is the co in coroutine. It's like a cooperative routine and routine is another word for function or uh, a task, you could say. Um, so it's also important then to consider that they're lightweight tasks, functions, 
and they execute concurrently, but not in parallel. So um, for I don't know if the fourth semester had OS yet, operating systems yet, but uh, to summarize uh, quickly, concurrently will basically mean that they run they don't run at the same time, but they run uh, among each other in a way that feels like they're in parallel to the user because the processor is so fast, basically, that running them concurrently right after each other at different places means basically feels to the user as if they're being run at the same time, but they're not actually being run at the same time. So whereas threads will often be run in parallel, so the code is executing two pieces of code at the same time instead of I'm doing this piece and now I'm yielding and doing a completely different function and then afterwards. So that's one way of thinking about them. And that also takes us back to the whole lightweight threads concept. Uh, since to the great. Uh, I see the chat is posted. Yeah. Uh, uh, async await is basically a way. It's basically a coroutine in a way. Yeah, that's so. Async await is very frequently used keywords. Um, in Kotlin, there's suspend, but they also have await. Uh, but they use suspend instead of async as the keyword. Uh, but yes, async await is essentially uh, that. Uh, but yeah, they're lightweight since you don't need a system call to create them. Um, uh, when you create threads, you need uh, to do system calls because it's the operating system's basic responsibility to uh, deal with that. A coroutine can be created by basically by the program, by the software. So you don't, you don't need to go through the system call. Uh, and at the same time, you don't need to create a stack. So threads usually have separate stacks. Um, you don't need that for a coroutine since they, yeah, I think, yeah, you think, I think you need to save, you definitely do need to save some information about where they are. Um, so I guess that's from Per Morton in the chat. So, so yes, but I, the overhead overall is still less than a thread. And uh, next point is since they're executed concurrently and not in parallel, uh, to use them, you don't need mutexes or synchronization primitives to use them safely. So they will not access data at the same time since they're not actually run at the same time, even if it feels like that way. Um, so that's a way to think of them as how they're lightweight. Um, you can actually also implement your own coroutine system in any language. Uh, it will, it's probably better when it's supported natively by the language. But since they base themselves off of cooperative scheduling, uh, you can create a simple cooperative system by uh, writing your own cooperative scheduler and that execute tasks. So uh, maybe that's what we can look at in the example. Uh, yeah. So let's have a bit look at uh, some problems that they can solve. Um, if you think about what we already have, uh, we know that they can yield, they can stop executing somewhere. Uh, we know they take less resources. Uh, we know they don't need uh, synchronization primitives. Uh, so if you can think of anything, you are free to write it in the chat before we start discussing what's been provided. Yeah, I see that reveal everything at once. Well, that's fine. Um, so if we think about threads and coroutines, um, we can think about threads to be a great solution to maybe data processing parallelism. If you need more processing power to process data, like big amounts of data, uh, then like a coroutine that works concurrently is not exactly going to make the data processing faster necessarily. Um, 
since you still have say 10 gigabytes of data that you have to go through and do some sort of algorithm on. Uh, if you have multiple threads, then you can work in parallel at several, several steps of that uh, data. So you can have one start at the zeroth element, one start at the 10,000th element, and then so forth. And then if you have, then you can use 12 threads if your computer has 12 cores. And it will go faster. Uh, coroutines, however, are often a lot very great for I.O. concurrency. So um, if your bottleneck is I.O., so that will be uh, network calls, database operations, or other operations where the CPU would otherwise be idle because it's doing synchronous operations like one after another, um, then coroutines would be a, a great solution since that allows you to do the network call, as we discussed, and then say, I yield. And then some other task can go and do something while the network call is waiting for a response. Um, database operations are basically the same thing because you do a query and then you have to wait for the IO operation to finish. Um, and uh, yeah, there are other IO, you can probably think about a similar thing. I mean, that's very uh, far out there. Um, but uh, basically tasks where the CP would otherwise be idle. Uh, there's another great use for coroutines as well, and that's in uh, game programming. Uh, writing AI cutscenes, uh, dialogue, and things like that with coroutines can actually be a very powerful tool. Uh, so a lot of people put, for example, Lua in as part of their games, which has native support for coroutines. And then you can write uh, basically, cutscenes you can write them synchronously, but you execute them just partially, like uh, like we discussed with coroutines. So, uh, for example, if you play a animation for an NPC, you will start by a play smile animation, and then it starts doing that for one frame, and it yields. And the next frame, it keeps playing that, and then you have a new function which is say something, and then you get the dialogue bubble over the head. Uh, so if you think about it, that's a way of uh, having asynchronous actions happen in a interactive medium. So actions that last over the duration of multiple frames, where you can think of the frame as maybe like the uh, step, the point in time that you're waiting for. So using coroutines for a game uh, games is actually a, can can be very powerful for writing. Uh, yeah, AI cutscenes, you name it. And another thing about coroutines is they can often be a very good solution to callbacks. So callbacks are in a way just uh, an IO, another IO delay, since you're doing something and then you're going to get a callback when it's done. Uh, and then you write it in a synchronous way. So if we take a look, I think the chat maybe blocks this, but uh, if we look at this example, uh, callback versus coroutine, I think it's pretty easy to say which one is easier to reason about. But if you take the callback first, uh, you have to do the fetch uh, to database to get the users. And then in here, we have the callback that gets the users back. And then you can use the users, which leads you want to fetch the passwords for those users. And then you want to have another callback inside of the first callback because you can't put this callback outside of the first one because then it will it wouldn't execute at the right time then we just execute right away and then you wouldn't have access to the user data that you need and then inside of here you have another fetch to some yada whatever which then takes a network and fail callback which has to handle both the success and the failure case and then you and the more things you have to start chaining like this so in it's going to nest quite deep and it's going to be unreadable. Uh, so the coroutine alternative is basically, it looks exactly like synchronous code. You have users, you just fetch them and you assign them to a variable. Then you set the text field, you get the passwords by fetching with the users. Uh, and then you just try to write it to the database and get an OK variable back instead of using this huge callback. And if it's not okay, then you return the error state. 
and in the other case it's the success state so you it's a lot more readable and easier to reason about the logic that is happening you can assign to variables just like you can yeah like call back hell yeah uh, from the chat uh, that's basically what this is it's a call back hell and the other thing is you can actually return a value here from a function whereas in the callback uh, play, uh, function you can't actually return because if you return here you're actually returning from the unsuccess function and not from the function that's calling this entire chunk. Uh, so, and here you have to assign it to some class variable. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, so it's a lot easier to just to deal with everything when it's uh, you're dealing with asynchronous operations like this. So uh, this is a pretty good example of how you can use coroutines, at least you can make code more readable. Um, finally, let's have a look at, you have a lot more languages than this that uh, support it. Uh, we have uh, Kotlin, it's probably the language I've used Coritis the most, and I feel like they have a very smooth and solid integration of it. So I recommend if you want to play with it and get started quickly, I would recommend, uh, I have some resources later, I would recommend trying in Kotlin and just use uh, uh, do what you can there. Uh, C20 added support for coroutines, but uh, a bit convoluted, I would say. Uh, or what do you think, Per Morten? Uh, Lua has native support, so and it's an embeddable scripting language. So if you want to work with that, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a good place to start as well. Uh, especially if you're doing a game or something from scratch, uh, you can use coroutines there. Uh, Rust has it uh, with the async await as well. Uh, but it's, uh, you have, oftentimes you will use a support library to make it more easy to work with, like Tokyo, which we won't look at today, but uh, I'll add some links in the, in the final slide about how to use it. Python also has the concept of async await. Go, I put a question mark because Go routines are a bit uh, different or weird, I would say. Uh, like they can execute in threads. Well, actually, I don't know if they're just Go routines or threads or a mix between. Yeah, they, they, they have some, yeah. I put a question mark on there, but, uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, or you can write a simple implementation yourself, like a cooperative uh, scheduler, and then you can, yeah, there they kind of are uh, looking at the chat. Yeah. Uh, or you can write it, write this implementation yourself. Um, that can do a pretty good job of at least emulating the concept of a coroutine. So uh, in Rust, you can try Actix Web, with it, which is an actor framework that allows you to create uh, web. It's a web framework based on an actor model. So uh, it's really powerful for writing HTTP servers, uh, APIs, whatever you want. And, it, and or Tokyo, if you want to go more raw on uh, what you can do and build things up from the basics. Uh, there's a basic tutorial for Kotlin. Uh, using coroutines in Android is almost an absolute must in these days. If you don't do it, then you probably should do it. Um, especially if you do anything with networking. Uh, that's, just, that's just the way uh, it works nowadays. So, and in C++, there's a link to a convoluted intro to coroutines there if you want to dive in. Um, so, apart from that, um, unless we have questions, this is sort of uh, the overview. Uh, we can maybe look at uh, some sort of an example as well. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, guys, any questions for the first part? Yeah, we can uh, we can leave the discussion and a little bit more on on that after um oh yeah there is a question 
Um, I can find the resource since I don't think we have time to look at it now, given that two other people are going to speak as well. But I can uh, go and look for it while uh, the others are talking. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yep. All right, Per Morten. So I think you can uh, you can go now. Right. So uh, thank you for um, the presentation, Carl. It was uh, quite interesting. So um, um, I'm doing it a bit, uh, taking a bit of a different uh, topic. Um, I'm going to sort of talk about, uh, so everyone can see the screen now, right? Yeah, yeah. we can so, we can see your slides. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I'm talk talking about programming languages. Um, I'm sort of going to talk about, about my story with C and C++ and then programming languages as tools before sort of reaching a conclusion. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I am, my name is Per Morten. I teach um, professional programming. Although my main job is working uh, on um, a VR application for um, uh, visiting sort of uh, buildings in VR before they're actually built. Uh, using Unity. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to start with my story about C++ because I think there's something to 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 learn there, and that sort of warrants a discussion um, in the yeah afterwards. Um, yeah, so essentially my story with C++ is probably a bit similar to uh, the rest of you. So I started with um, um, I started with sort of. Um, I, I knew a bit of programming before I started. I programmed a bit in Java, but not much. So, uh, and C sharp. Uh, so, yeah, I started with uh, C with classes, and um, I'd already sort of heard from a lot of the other students that, um, or this more senior student, that like the C that we the C plus plus that we learned weren't like really C plus plus, and C plus plus was or or C was like outdated and stuff like that that we couldn't sort of use um use standard facilities like std string that that was sort of really um uh, like really controversial essentially um so yeah did the sort of see with classes approach as you did um I, however i did take in some standard facilities so i was using std string um instead of character pointers um i've also heard people saying like object-oriented programming is really great and um, we weren't really being taught that sort of properly, apparently. Um, however, we did learn some sort of lightweight object-oriented programming in the object-oriented programming course. Um, and one thing I sort of saw looking back at the time is that at that point, most of my problems that I was solving were sort of solved with straightforward logic, loops, and memory management. Um, not really sort of complicated memory management, but you should just uh, like manual deletes and uh, and manual news, um, but yeah, most of uh, the stuff was sort of very straightforward in logic, so it was somewhat readable at least, and the problem sort of um, fixed themselves to a certain extent. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get a summer job at uh, Kongsberg uh, in the def missile defense um, uh, part. And um, uh, if, for not for missile or defense, for writing uh, drones for a sort of a civilian car race to follow um, follow a car. And during that, I started to learn C++ 11 and C++ 14. And I learned a lot about like uh, the C++ standard library facilities. So vector, uh, string, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and we're sort of encouraged to use it. Uh, unique pointers, shared pointers. Um, yeah, all of that just. And I also learned a lot about sort of interfaces and uh, particular object-oriented architecture. Like this was sort of the first introduction I got to architecture in general. And I was uh, really sort of hungry for knowledge on this stuff. So if we didn't have anything to do, a lot of the other sort of summer interns would sit around um, on Facebook or, or, or read the news or whatever. However, I would sit on CPP reference and lead, read up on like C++ standard library facilities and stuff like that um, 
to really sort of get into it. And that sort of continued on once I got back after the summer internship. I started watching talks from programming conferences, uh, CppCon. I started sort of trying to get into um, caring about the C++ standard development, like C++ 17, and, and uh, reading up on the features of that. And I saw that I sort of started to solve my problems through architecture uh, a lot. So I would constantly come up with, like, try to come up with clean interfaces and base classes and uh, all of the logic and loops and stuff like that was usually very sort of separated. It was hidden um, behind sort of, yeah, I, as I said, clean interfaces and named functions. And um, rather than sort of the, the very clear logic um, that was before. So memory management, I decided that that wasn't really something I would care about a lot. So that sort of got uh, relegated to like unique pointers and shared pointers and stuff like that. And what sort of happened is that over time, I actually became what I would say uh, a modern C++ and object-oriented bigot. So I would sort of do like overly complicated patterns everywhere because I was reading pattern books at the time. Uh, all the code needed to be generic and reusable. So no code actually had sort of any context, like everything was really abstract. Um, and sort of I did dynamic allocations everywhere um, using like std string or std vector or whatever. And um, a lot of the group members that I that I worked with isn't necessarily always understand what I wrote. And looking back at some of that code now, I don't really understand it either. Um, so yeah, it, and I, I would sort of point out like if, if people um, in my group were sort of doing stuff that wasn't necessarily uh, sort of the most modern way or whatever, I would, I would point out, I mean, even though if it wasn't necessarily anything wrong with, um, with the code in question. Elegant code using the use features was almost more important than sort of functional code. <laughs> Or like the code actually working, um, and this led to some problems. So it led me down a very sort of perfectionist mindset, uh, where I would try to sort of architecture stuff uh, up front and come up with sort of the perfect solution, um, and that would that would make me really unproductive because you know obviously I wouldn't come up with a perfect solution, but because you, you can't really without knowing the problem properly and. Um, it actually led to the sort of problem where I started to question if I actually knew how to program because I <clears throat> like I was struggling so much and I was creating so many files, writing so much code, but like most of the code didn't actually do anything. And because of sort of this uh, unfortunate mindset that I had that I would sort of lean on the compilers or 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 um, uh, or the library writers, uh, I would essentially not care in certain courses like I didn't really pay attention in the algorithms course because I was just like when I'm going to write a sorting algorithm myself I mean I'm just going to use sort of what the what the standard library gives me and that's probably still true that I won't really write the sorting algorithms myself but sort of disregarding entire courses like the point of that course isn't to write sorting algorithms it's about trying to learn about algorithms but yeah so I've sort of became a real um, I would say bigot, and it was sort of um, probably um, a bit problematic for for the groups that I was uh, working with. And it was to a certain extent holding me back. Um, like I, I knew a lot of cool stuff, but it wasn't really that sort of useful. And sort of being an architect was, yeah. I usually took the architect role in the in the um, uh, in the. Uh, in group projects, and that wouldn't necessarily always work. Um, luckily, I was sort of exposed to differing opinions from the games industry in certain conferences, like CPCon, there was a really good talk by Mike Acton, and I was sort of hesitant to listen to that at the, at the time, but after sort of um, being more exposed to it and being exposed to it on Twitter and talking to people from sort of the, particular the, the part of sort of the more hardcore games industry, so um, a lot of um, console developers, etc. Um, as I've heard uh, uh, some 
objections towards sort of the modern C++ and template stuff. Um, also, I forgot to sort of mention here that like templates became a really big thing. Like I, I went completely nuts with trying to get into template meta programming, which was sort of unreadable and sort of in, in general destroyed compile times. Um, however, so after having heard uh, differing opinions from the people, I decided to try proper C or, or try C in general, like not C with classes, just go straight to C. Um, <clears throat> for a GPU programming course, which we had, but unfortunately, um, unfortunately don't have. Um, and yes, yeah, as, as Marius brings up here, like uh, we sort of went super over-engineered on a lot of our projects. So in in graphics programming, we did Pac-Man with a sort of basic component system similar to what Unity does. And it's, uh, yeah, it's it was, uh, um, looking at it now, it sort of makes me shiver. Um, so yeah, I, I went to 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 see to try and to try and see sort of what all the fuss was about um, and and see what I could learn from there. And um, it sort of gave me some really cool experiences. So uh, in general, like C is a pretty simple language in that it doesn't really have that many features, and particularly it lacks a lot of the convenient but complex features of C plus plus. So for instance, you don't have like standard like writing a hash map in C is pretty pretty annoying like because uh, you need to actually write the hash map yourself there's no sort of standard hash map however in c++ there is a standard hash map so using that is sort of as easy as you know including another map or whatever um and that's might seem bad that i would need to write up sort of these complicated uh, collections myself but it actually didn't because i would rarely take the time to write them up Instead, I was sort of forced by the language to make really simple solutions that made stuff work. Um, so I would usually just use sort of arrays, and that would be like nine out of ten times I would use an, uh, an array. Um, and I couldn't really do that much architecturing up front because there wasn't sort of necessarily a type system or or a language or a community pushing me in a direction of where I should. Uh, how I should architecture my solution. There weren't really that many like patterns or or, or or best practices or stuff like that. That is not what I knew of. So I sort of quickly returned to like solving most problems with sort of straightforward logic uh, loops and and but then more complex memory management than I did management. And um, first of all, it sort of boosted my confidence because I got back to see that hey, I can actually program. <laughs> Um, and it sort of also started to lead me to some really fundamental truths. So I got sort of the respect for that. Hey, you know, types are a thing that we talk a lot about in, in programming languages. They don't actually exist. Like everything is just bytes. And if you're sort of, or, or bits, and if you're sort of down in the C level and you have pointers, then you can reinterpret stuff, whatever, whatever the way you want, that's most convenient for you now, because um you know it's it's just sort of your computer don't have doesn't have types so that's completely fine you don't need to sort of be tied down to to that um uh, by that when they don't really expose it um i also learned that computers are incredibly fast if you don't actually get in the way so uh, it's easy to think like how long time you used to start a word or photoshop or something like that it's usually you know it takes a while and, uh, and, you know, modern computers feel really slow. And, um, but they really aren't like when you're talking about sort of five gigahertz uh, processors or, or like four gigahertz processors, that's an insane amount of instructions that can be executed per second. Uh, so, um, but, what I sort of found before when my computer was when I was creating programs that were slow, what it was that I was usually sort of assuming that the that the, um, uh, that the the CPU was slow, so I was trying to sort of be smart on its behalf, um, and usually that didn't actually work uh, because it's sort of at least what I saw from C as I, it was sort of way easier to to write just dumb code and have it perform super well because there was so you were closer to sort of the hardware. Uh, than trying to be really smart and sort of the the final fundamental truth that I came about this is it's that program is essentially just about moving memory around like that's the only thing you're actually doing like if you're having if you're creating a video game the only thing you're really doing say that you want to draw a mesh on screen well you're sort of sending that gpu memory over to the um, 
uh, over to the GPU, and that the GPU has to render it and create sort of a texture, and then that texture uh, sort of gets put through the HDMI cable. So like the only and doing networking calls, like doing REST APIs and stuff, that's also essentially just sending memory back and forth between a server and um, and the client. So everything is essentially just about memory. And this sort of started to lead me towards uh, a paradigm that's called data oriented design, uh, which is a programming paradigm very focused on sort of transforming data. And it, it sort of um, stands very in opposition to object oriented programming. And if you want to learn anything more uh, more about it, I would suggest um, uh, reading my master thesis or uh, or talking to me um, in general. So yeah, so the the point here is sort of just to give to sort of show. Um, yeah, I, I found this meme, or that is something similar to this uh, on Twitter a while, um, a while ago. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the original, but this is sort of my 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 journey. Like I started with C, and then went with C with classes, and then modern C++, and then I went template metaprogramming, and then I went back to C. And then uh, when I saw this meme originally, someone asked like, "What's the what's the difference between the first and second um, second introduction of C?" And then the response was just like enlightenment, because um, for me, sort of the, the, my code has got way easier by and um, uh, sort of simpler to read uh, and work with by sort of dropping back to 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 the roots and going back to the C uh, C level. Um, so the other thing that I really learned was that that program languages are essentially just tools. Uh, again, if you take the sort of fundamental truth that programming is just about moving memory around, then program languages are essentially just tools to help you move that memory around. Um, and some tools really excel at that and others don't. And the, the, the thing that is important to like think of program languages as tools is that that way you can sort of make a rational decision when you're trying to figure out which tool you should go for. Like religious adherence and learning language isn't really great because they all have um, they all have sort of different trade-offs. So if you're working a garbage collected language, the benefit there is that you largely don't have to care about memory management, or at least that's the sort of proposed proposed benefit. However, the, the trade-off is that you know um, it's harder to ensure that you have good memory access performance or good memory access for performance, and that can be uh, really important on modern modern CPUs. Um, uh, you'll notice that I talk uh, I mentioned performance quite a lot, and that's because it's sort of important to me for for the job that I'm, I'm working in and, and important for me in in general. Um, so yeah, um, a sort of trade-off with you know interpreted languages is that you know the, the benefit is that you don't need to compile them because they're interpreted. So you have super fast iteration times and you can like really knock stuff out very quickly and, and prototype and stuff like that. However, it's it's usually less efficient than a compiled solution. However, if you sort of go crazy on the compiled solutions, then you'll end up with like that took 48 hours to compile the entire solution um so uh, which 48 hours to compile that's at least that's going to break your um that's going to break sort of uh, your iteration flow uh, i'll tell you that and then uh, you know cross platform languages like say java and c sharp like they can usually you can code against a virtual machine so you don't really need to care about platform specifically and that's great until you need to care about the platform specifically. Like it's it's rarely the case that a language that sells itself as write once run everywhere actually is write once runs run everywhere, especially when the program gets a bit more complicated. And in those situations, it can be really hard to um, to sort of work in a platform specific manner when the language does everything it can to avoid you talking about platforms. So sort of depending on the problem you have, you need to really think about sort of the different trade offs that a language might might impose. Um, because programming languages are essentially created by people, and those people have, um, and the languages are greatly influenced about how those people think that you should program. Um, and they, the programming languages might have very different priorities than you have. Uh, so uh, they might be sort of spec towards performance, they might be spec towards uh, avoiding sort of basic um, uh, memory um issues um like avoiding like uh, avoiding ma manual memory management stuff and like program languages also are usually created for very generic situations especially the ones that we use are sort of very often multi-purpose languages created for generic situations like take c plus plus the sort of range of what the c plus plus standard has to support or the, the spec it goes everywhere from like games to high frequency trading to embedded systems with like a megabyte of memory to um, like regular desktop apps. And those have very different um, 
and very different uh, constraints that you need to work under. So if you're working on an embedded system, you probably will care a lot about memory management. So using most of the standard library probably goes out the window because you don't really have control over the memory management that uh, that uh, is done using uh, when you're using sort of the standard library. Um, so, and you also need to sort of verify that the program languages that you use are actually sort of delivering on what they promise. So if someone sort of promises that, you know, this garbage collector is the best, it can't be beaten by like manual memory management. And then still you have to go and sort of implement pooling uh, or object pooling because you need to, to avoid garbage collection. Then that's, you know, something that you should like, is that really great? Is that something that you should like try to hack around the way that languages perform to 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 um, sort of work the way that that uh, that is best for your case and you should also really sort of pay attention to the intended or idiomatic way of writing and of programming in language like as i said like garbage collected languages like java and c sharp actively encourages you not to think about memory access or at least that's sort of my 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 view on it and uh, so you're not really, which again can make it hard to 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 optimize for memory access if that's a problem that you actually have. Um, I also say that object-oriented programming languages in general encourages not thinking about optimal memory layouts, which greatly reduces vectorization potential. So for those of you who uh, don't know what vectorization is, it's essentially that your computer has the facilities to do multiple instructions in one sort of um, a sort of one instruction so you can say um, if you have four floats um, and you want to add them uh, or sort of you have you have eight floats and then you want to add four of them together with the other four then you can either you can do that as like um, four operations uh, which your CPU can do that or uh, if you sort of think about how your memory layout is then you can do that as one operation uh, using specialized uh, hardware on the CPU um, which your compiler can also uh, you should do for you if you if you think about memory layout up front um, so these are sort of what I would say to at least in terms of performance these are sort of two negatives um, in in ways that uh, sort of intended or idiomatic ways to program um, Affect you. One thing I would say is a sort of a positive is is I, I work a lot with uh, Unity and their new sort of um, C dialect or C sharp dialect called um, high performance C sharp, which uh, strips away essentially all of C sharp until you're left with basically C. Um, and the way that that language is sort of inc in, uh, encourages you to work in a structure of race uh, format. Um, and uh, because it's sort of a pain to modify structs in containers in in, in C sharp because you don't have ref returns. So if I want to if I, if I have a struct with like five mem um, uh, five member variables and I want to modify one of those, I have to sort of pull the entire structure out of the of the collection and then I need to modify the one variable I need and then. Essentially, like three lines of code to change one variable. Um, however, if you sort of have, um, if you if you sort of write your um, uh, in, in an SOA format, so you essentially write uh, like you put all your variables in one array of one one type, sort of in one array, and all the variables of um, another uh, variable in another array, then you can um, sort of easily um, you don't sort of uh, um, feel the pain of of the of lacking ref returns. And the good thing about this is that that usually sort of increases the vectorization potential that the compiler can give you. Um, so yeah, it's it's sort of um, really important that you that you sort of think about this sort of stuff. So in conclusion, like program languages are tools to help you move memory around and they'll sort of, they will try to influence how you write your code and they should be used in different situations. Like, um, another sort of meme I found. Uh, this I don't agree with all of these um, these pictures here, but I agree with like Python being a chainsaw. That makes sense uh, because usually when you when you're doing stuff in Python, you just want to get sort of stuff done quickly. Um, so you're sort of you know you're, you're cutting down a tree. That's something you usually want to do with you know a chainsaw. However, if you're sort of say that you're doing um, wood carving that's you there you usually sort of start with a chainsaw and then after a while you need to sort of carve the various patterns that you want to do and then you want want sort of more specialized tools like you know assembly or whatever which here is um you know you can sort of just see here that that's sort of really 
um, uh, really sort of um, detailed work. And, and all of these are sort of different tools that have very different uh, contexts that they should be used in. Um, also try and like, don't be a language bigot. Don't go in the, uh, don't go in the, um, in the sort of trap that I, I did. And lastly, sort of make sure that you actually use the tool and it's not that the tool is using you because it's, it's very easy to fall into like the tool using you instead of you actually using the tool. So yeah, um, are there any questions or comments? If not, then I guess we I'll just give it over to to Marsh. Thank you very much. That was a great uh, great talk. Um, yeah, questions, guys. Should we have a, a short break or should we continue? Who is for like having a, a very short, like three minutes break? Uh, no one. Co yeah, it's fine. Chorus for a break. Yeah. All right. Let's have a, let's have a small break until um, yeah. What three minutes? Yeah, because we started a bit late and we need to. to have yeah, time and we we discussion. need to get through this. All right. So yeah. I will set up a timer and then we have a three minutes break. Okay, uh, so let's let's continue. Uh, let me just change my background. Okay. So what I will do is I will kind of wrap up a little bit what has been discussed so far, and I will refresh uh, the programming paradigms for the second year. Uh, the third year had the lecture already, so I will try to go quick through that. Um, so there is a, a possibility of asking questions through the uh, Mentimeter. Uh, please uh, join uh, the Mentimeter because uh, you, you can kind of uh, contribute a little bit to the discussion. So um, the first poll is uh, what programming paradigms you know of and what, you know, what you're using. Yeah, great. Yeah. It, it didn't say anywhere that Mentimeter just uh, sort of uh, finishes up when you press enter, because I was uh, thinking I would go to the next and, and, and the other stuff I use. I see. Yeah, the UI is sometimes a little bit um, counterintuitive. All right, so what uh, paradigm? Yeah, imperative, great. Uh, Data-oriented, object-oriented. Shut up. Functional. Yeah, so those are the kind of the main ones uh, you are already familiar with. So let's procedural. Okay, logical. That's good. Uh, visual. All right, some uh, <laughs> spaghetti code is not really a good one. All right, let's move on. Um, so some prerequisites before we, we discuss it. Um, so paradigm is kind of a way of thinking about something or a way of a uh, particular way of doing something. So it's kind of an abstract term. And then a language, as you've been highlighted by, uh, as it was highlighted by uh, Per Morten, is a kind of a tool. It's a mechanism to express a certain solution. So paradigms are kind of abstraction, abstract, and languages are concrete. And what does it mean is that you should not say, you know, um, C++ is an object-oriented language because object-oriented is a paradigm and a language by definition is a concrete thing which cannot be abstract. Uh, so there are no programming language paradigms. There are only programming paradigms. 
And C++ can be used to express an object-oriented paradigm, but in it itself, it cannot be an object-oriented, right? So um, try to be precise. Of course, people say that. They say Haskell is functional language or C++ is object-oriented language, but you, know, you will know better that that's not strictly speaking true, okay? Uh, you can program functional way in C++, and you can program an object-oriented way in C++ uh, or, uh, you know, in another paradigms. So uh, Per Morton spent some time talking about imperative uh, programming. So the kind of an explicit sequence of commands which are given to the computer. Uh, and then the, those commands are kind of ordered in a sequence and they update some sort of a computational state. And you manipulate the resources directly, right? So we all usually start with imperative programming, and that's kind of the main, you know, a mainstream of how things are being programmed. Um, a kind of a, a variation of imperative programming is structured programming, which is a form of imperative programming where you have a little bit cleaner uh, nested structure of, of control flow, such that you try to avoid go to statements, right? In a pure uh, imperative way, you, you know, everything goes and you sort of quite similar to assembly. Um, uh, in a structured programming language, uh, in the structured programming paradigm, uh, you're trying to be a little bit more clean, uh, but they are very kind of alike. Uh, in fact, structured programming is an imperative programming. Um, then we have procedural. So that's kind of a, a one step further along this kind of a chain of uh, organizing the programming paradigms. Uh, and here, the, the fundamental thing that you have is, is procedures. Uh, what is the difference between procedures and functions? Well, procedures don't return anything. So if you have a function that is kind of returning void, that can be considered a procedure. Um, functions typically need to return something, and then pure functions always return the same thing for the same input. Um, so that's how you know the, the nomenclature of the procedure kind of works. So Pascal is, is an imperative structured procedural programming language. Um, all right, then we have a different path of this, you know, discussing programming and it's kind of declarative. So instead of giving the computer exact sequence of what needs to be done, uh, we specifying what needs to be done, but not how it should be done. So declarative uh, paradigms, um, they focus on specification rather than the sequence of instructions. Uh, so you're specifying the result or you're specifying what you mean and then how exactly it's going to be executed. You don't necessarily saying that. All right, so th those are kind of uh, all that you've known so far. Uh, the people who are doing a second year, they have been exposed to functional uh, paradigm. Uh, where functions play a fundamental role. Uh, and then you're trying to avoid global state and you're trying to use uh, kind of a functional composition and make sort of the expression of what needs to be done through combining and um, um, up applying functions. So th there are some other terms like applicative functional paradigm or combinatorial functional paradigm, which are kind of stressing a certain way of working with functions, but you know, you get the feel of what functional um, paradigm is about. So then, uh, yeah, we have object-oriented. Uh, you, you covered that quite well in the previous courses and uh, Per Morton talked about it. Um, the one thing that I want to add here is that object orientation can be class-based or prototype-based. So there were some early uh, object-oriented programming um, um, models which were not class-based. So uh, like, for example, self, uh, which is a language uh, which was a precursor to Java, uh, you didn't have classes in that language. You had sort of a, a prototypes and it kind of feels a little bit like JavaScript, right? JavaScript is not class-based. Um, it doesn't have a class-based object orientation. It, it has sort of more of a prototype uh, object orientation. So th those are kind of a two fundamental um, you know, uh, forks in, in the paradigm. All right, so then uh, someone mentioned the logic or rule-based. 
we have typically forward chaining or backward chaining rule engine, which will kind of be able to infer things for us. Uh, and that the language that is sort of a, a good example of uh, supporting a logic uh, paradigm is Prolog. Uh, but there are also some rule-based systems uh, for expert systems or for backwards and forward chaining. So the, 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 the key here, the, the key element here is that the reasoning engine is kind of built in into the, um, the runtime system and then you can kind of take advantage of it. All right, here is a, a simple problem. So this is like a, a your typical uh, you know, newspaper puzzle. Uh, you have uh, letters representing um, digits and then you, know, you want to solve it. So I'm giving you a task, you know, what is S, what is E, what is N, what is D, like what digits those are, such that cent plus more will kind of end up with uh, money. Uh, so we basically need to have kind of a two numbers here all are represented by uh, some digits, four digits, four digits, and then I have a five digit answer and then the digits have to be consistent. What would you use to solve this? How would you solve this? How would you write a program that solves this? Some ideas? So the problem is to find what is S, what digit is S, what digit is E, what digit is N and what digit is D and M and O and R and Y. So they are all different digits such that if you substitute the letters with the digit, this equation will be correct. Yeah, brute force, of course. So uh, per Morton would just use loops and brute force search through the, uh, how many letters we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight. So we have eight digits. So you will probably have um, seven nested loops and then you just brute force the search of what are the, the digits for the letters, right? Yeah, you could paralyze this search, paralyze the brute force. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what I would think Per Morten would say. <laughs> so I wouldn't use a GPU and I wouldn't use the brute force for this for that one. I would use a, a language which is called Oz, and in Oz you can basically express that I have eight variables. The variables are digits and that the variables are different such that they don't, you know, they are not the same. And then I could express this equation in OS and it, the uh, reasoning engine would solve it for me, right? So it would probably do some form of uh, optimized brute force or whatever the engine is doing, like some, some magic, uh, but I would not have to think about it. Uh, so that leads us to the constraint-based programming. So constraint-based is a paradigm where you have some form of a set of constraints that you can express usually over a finite domains or um, discrete domains. And then you have an inference engine which basically can solve this type of problems for you. Uh, and that is quite convenient because it's a very readable representation of what the problem is. And then it is usually quite an optimized solution for a particular problem. Um, we, yeah, we can come back to that later because I'm sure uh, Per Morten would say that if he knows exactly the details of the problem, he would do a better job than the generic purpose inference engine, which is built in into us. And I agree with that, but then it would cost much more time. Um, anyway, well, let's move on. Uh, we can come back to that. So the constraint base is another paradigm, which is quite useful. And it is sometimes, um, helpful for some of the problems. Uh, there, another paradigm that hasn't been mentioned is event-driven. So that's usually where you have uh, emitters and listeners of some sort, and you have some sort of asynchronous messaging going on. Uh, and then you can asynchronously react to those events. So the emitters and listeners are kind of you know, hooked up together and you can kind of uh, 
uh, react to, to, to certain things, which is kind of similar a little bit to that uh, paradigm which um, Carl was talking about, which is kind of a concurrent programming. Uh, so concurrent programming, you, you have kind of multiple things that happen uh, concurrently, uh, and then uh, they do happen independently of each other, and you have some sort of um, uh, multiple sequences of computations. So you have certain things that are kind of, for example, waiting for this particular IO to, con to, to finish, to continue, while some other things are kind of being done at the same time. So concurrent programming is what um, Carl talked about. And that's um, another kind of paradigm that uh, is often mixed with other paradigms. So paradigms are not uh, exclusive. And there are other. So there is an aspect-oriented, data-oriented, uh, stream-based programming, and you know other uh, that have been mentioned in the original pool as well. Uh, so that kind of, uh, to, to sum that up, um, languages are tools. Uh, languages support specific paradigms. Uh, most of languages are not 100% pure for a given paradigm. They are sort of a multi-paradigm. Uh, they support more than one potential paradigm um, in a way of the language um, facilities. Uh, and some languages are by design multi-paradigm, um, like C++, let's say. Uh, and then some languages are accidentally multi-paradigm. Like even if you have a single paradigm language, you can kind of implement uh, or express other paradigms in that language, even though it was not originally designed for that. So um, some multi-paradigm languages are kind of good in supporting multiple paradigms, like for example, Scala, it supports a functional object-oriented and uh, concurrent and so on paradigms, and it doesn't feel it gets in your way. Uh, whereas others, which are multi-paradigm, um, most noticeably I'm looking here at C++, they do support those multiple paradigms, but if you really wanted to do functional programming with C++, you would kill yourself. If you really wanted to do concurrent programming, you would probably kill yourself also as well. Uh, so they kind of say they you can do all of those paradigms in the language, but the way you have to go about it makes it really hard. Um, all right. Um, so the, the bottom line here is that programming languages um, support one or multiple paradigms, and they allow you pick a most suitable style for a given job. And that's what uh, Carl and Per Morton were kind of stressing, that given a particular task or given the particular job, you can kind of try to express it in the style that suits best that the problem, okay? Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, I have um, some uh, small um, quizzes for you. Uh, what is C, like in what paradigms you can program in C? What's the most suitable uh, paradigms that you can do programming in C? Yeah, data-driven or data-oriented. Just a quick note on that data-driven and data-oriented are two different- uh, Paradigms. Di different, different things. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that, those are all good answers. So it is kind of an example of um, uh, imperative structured. You can do procedural. You can do, um, you don't have to do procedural. <laughs> um, so how pure is C, like on, on some scales? I would say C is, kind of, uh, it's not necessarily a very multi-paradigm language, but it, of course it supports uh, multiple paradigms, uh, but it, it is kind of a compact and quite uh, quite pure, right? All right, so let's move on. Uh, Haskell, it's easy. So C and Haskell's are easy. Uh, they are quite pure. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, obvious. Uh, all right, let's move on. Uh, Go. Then things become a little bit more complicated. Um, all 
Yeah, very good. So it is again uh, an example of a uh, uh, imperative structured programming language. It has concurrent features built in. Uh, yeah, perfect. So that's um, yeah the object oriented. So let's uh, let me go here. So if you go to the definition of um, of what they did, um, sort of um, tagged the language with concurrent functional imperative and object oriented. Uh, the object oriented says it, it's not, um, but not in the usual way. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Rust. Yeah, that's that's typical. Um, so Rust is quite interesting. It does have uh, some functional features, um, not as fully supported, supporting functional paradigm as like Haskell, but it does have functional features which are much nicer and much kind of easier to use than C++. Um, it is imperative, but it does have some uh, declarative features too. Um, it is structured. So again, you kind of hit the, the good spot. Uh, so with Rust, it, it is mentioned concur concurrent, functional, imperative, and structured. Um, all right, so now just a kind of a quick poll on you. Which style suits you best, imperative or declarative? Or you don't mind either way? So we had this discussion with uh, Per Morton yesterday uh, about like personal traits biasing you towards a particular paradigm and a particular way of thinking, uh, such that uh, people have a kind of a tendency to to lean towards a particular you know tool or particular style. So it's kind of good to reflect a little bit on yourself and. Um, and get get kind of a clear on that. So yeah, majority of people say, yeah, it doesn't matter that much, but there is a heavy tail on the imperative style, of course. So um, looks like we have uh, one SQL programmer among us. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but it, it sort of depends in what context like because like i don't like i consider myself very imperative but i don't mind sort of sql because it's sort of it's sort of very constrained in mm. that like uh usually it's, and it's very sort of command base based so yeah or at least what i'm using for it so so yeah Yeah, exactly. So uh, Yuna says that uh, she voted uh, imperative, but she's perfectly happy with uh, SQL2. All right, that's uh, a little bit more contentious. So imperative versus object-oriented versus functional or something else. I know what Per Morton will say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. Yeah, well, I mean, it is technically, it's somewhat imperative, so such yeah. so. I, I kind of went through a little bit of a journey like a per Morton. I was sort of an object oriented uh, bigot for a while too, but I kind of got burned uh, with object orientation and I sort of don't feel like I, I like it anymore uh, for similar or different reasons than per Morton. Um, and you can see that, for example, in some of the modern languages, like, you know, relatively young, like uh, Golang or Rust, the object orientation is really different to what it used to be in the kind of a more older languages. Um, you still have certain features that kind of allow you to bind behavior with the uh, data, but it is much more decoupled. This uh, idea of binding uh, or encapsulating behavior together with data, that, that doesn't really work that well, I don't think. And of course, the hierarchy of uh, type systems like with the um inheritance that that has been sort of uh criticized quite heavily 
yeah just... but most people still are kind of in that uh in the in the object oriented uh way of thinking and that's yeah perfectly fine um everyone needs to follow their own kind of journey um so yeah just to kick off the discussion uh i just have a question why so like why you prefer that particular style right and there is no uh, no no single answer Yeah, so Svein, Svein Kore is kind of uh, pointing out that the object-oriented paradigm kind of uh, took over because uh, C didn't have modules and uh, inability to modularize your, your code was one of the drawbacks of the particular tool. And I, I, I agree with that. Uh, that um, is some argument, yeah? Yeah, I would also say that uh, that uh, one interesting thing I saw on on um, on French on particular Java, but all in general, is that the tooling support is usually amazing. So it's sort of uh, like looking up methods, for instance, on on like methods belonging to a class. Mm -hmm. That's you know you 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 have the class and then press dot and then you get sort of all the methods up. That's sort of uh at least short term where we like that that's great tooling like we don't really have any tooling that for for other paradigms that are really up to speed on on what the tooling for object oriented uh languages are um, yeah tooling is definitely a huge factor um the the tooling support for some languages makes or kills it uh and and, and tooling is very important i i totally agree with that But sort of, um, can I just ask what sort of modules you mean when you say that C didn't have modules? Because modules is sort of a term that that can mean different stuff. Yeah, so the, the ability to kind of uh, hide implementation details and expose some of the public API uh in a kind of a modular and a, and a kind of um namespace kind of way you have libraries of course uh but mm -hmm. that's about it like in c you can't sort of go fine fine grained the the, the level of library right yeah i mean people have to namespace stuff themselves but i wouldn't really yeah. consider that a problem uh, necessarily well, yeah, it, it is going the different direction. I think that some languages like say C sharp is namespacing and modularizing themselves too much so that they put sort of like the discussion we had yesterday with uh, with um, double vectors and uh, and um, uh, double vectors and um... okay, well, then what do you mean with modules? Just sort of so that I know what you're talking about. Okay. What are modules in Go, Marish? <laughs> For me, that <laughs> haven't done any Go programming. <laughs> yeah, it 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 is um, because that you is can a way module... of grouping of grouping uh, uh, components that you have into a module and then combining modules to form a, a larger structure. So you have that in in GoLang, you have that in um, in Rust. So you have this kind of a, a ability to organize your your yourself. In kind of a hierarchical way, right? Yeah. So, so C doesn't have that. That that is true, and also doesn't have kind of a namespaces, which well, is also you true. can do that. You can have sort of you can like if you need to encapsulate stuff, then that's possible in C. Just don't expose sort of, you know, you, you can use sort of really op actually you can use sort of more opaque encapsulated stuff in C than in a lot of other languages because. For instance, you don't have to expose memory layout, which is what you usually have to do in sort of object-oriented languages. Like have a void pointer, and then suddenly no one can actually see your type or anything about it. Yeah, that is true. Um, and uh, like you only put stuff in the only stuff you put in the headers are the stuff that you actually want to expose, and usually they don't they shouldn't contain the implementation details unless you're inlining stuff, which you shouldn't do most of the time. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah. So, so why people um, gravitate toward a particular choice of paradigm or particular choice of a language? So, you know, for example, you know, in Carl's case, I, I mean, he needs to program on Android and then there is kind of a limited uh, number of choices, right? Yes, very limited. <laughs> like you can use Java, but I wouldn't know. Yeah. Other than that, you have the cross-platform devices, but then accessing the platform specifics become harder, like Grimorton mentioned as well. Like yeah, exactly. Flutter and the React Native and all that stuff. So yeah, that, that's exactly the point. So you, you either go cross-platform and then you lose, like per, per Morton was talking about it, you lose the touch with the actual platform because you have an extra layer of, of indirection. Uh, you could go with uh, something like Java, but then uh, there are some drawbacks of doing that, to say the least. I was kind of a Java bigot too. So uh, I kind of liked the transition from, uh, uh, some of the prior languages to Java because of the reflection and some of the facilities the language was giving you uh, and some of the abstractions with the interfaces. So I kind of liked it. Uh, but then again, I kind of got burned uh, by the uh, a lot of tedious boilerplate that you have to do. So that's where the tooling comes. So people who work with Java, they have those kind of generators which generate this kind of, uh, you know, thousands of lines of code for you. Uh, and then it's so it's sort of is less painful, but it, it is still painful, right? Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> Which is cool because now we have, a, <laughs> yeah, it's also cool that now that you have a tool that can duplicate code for you. <laughs> so you don't have to do it yourself. <laughs> That's right. So it, it, it became kind of a nightmare. If you have a kind of a large project, then you kind of uh, need to heavily use this. And uh, yeah, I mean, come on. There must be a better way, right? Um, uh, I noticed when I was working in Java for the, the um, because uh, I just talked about the importance of tooling and Java having relatively good tooling. But I, I remember one thing that really annoyed me in in uh, when I was doing Java programming for the um, uh, application development course. Um, uh, I actually had to turn off those features a lot. <laughs> so because both the IDs, like I, I was using Rider and, um, uh, or not Rider, um, it is right and the other one that i don't remember what the name of this but it's like yeah coming from visual studio it was sort of a completely different experience adverse world um and yeah. one thing that really annoyed me was that uh, uh this constant exist uh, insistence on every every key on the keyboard being a commit instead of like having tab be the sort of accept the suggested suggested result so i would sort of write lambdas and then um, I would sort of say, okay, this takes, you know, an event or something, and then I didn't have to specify the type because that was sort of implicit. But as soon as I finished up the event, it just sort of auto-completed to like, oh, did, like event listener, maybe object own memory thing, <laughs> magic, that is like 100 characters. And then I would go like, no, I meant like, I want the variable which doesn't have any type to be named event. And then I would delete the up to the event, and then I would press enter, and then it would expand again. <laughs> So then I sort of had to go and turn the, the IntelliSense off, or at least say that like I don't want that to show up until like at least a second after I'm finished typing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Objective-C is another language with a very long uh, function names and method names and uh, very verbose way of writing code, which ends up like very longish sentences uh, that some people love it, uh, but... Uh, I kind of didn't go into that. <laughs> yeah, I would say sort of coming back to the original question about like why I pre prefer what I prefer. Um, so because I do mainly try to do data oriented. Um, I'll just sort of note that now that since I'm working in 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 C sharp or or in Unity, um, using Unity I prefer in C sharp. That's sort of that's the way that I'm I'm pushed. Um, but I sort of the reason that I like it is that it's it's usually usually st very straightforward, and I can write sort of super dumb code that just brute forces stuff. And then because I sort of get memory 
performance benefits than I yeah the brute force sort of usually works because it's uh, it's um, the computer is so fast so I, I yeah it sort of, it does let me to write dumber code but that's also easier for to understand however it's sort of obviously it requires you to to um, to to change the way you think a bit so when when we sort of reviewed at work the first sort of Code piece of code that I did that I did on a really sort of data oriented uh, structure of race type uh, approach. Um, it, it's it's you sort of saw that some people's brains were leaking a bit out of their their ears in the beginning, but then after a while you sort of get used to that and then then it's fine. Um, so are, are the people in in your company also doing kind of data oriented or um, it's only you? It's mainly me, but that's also because I'm usually the one that sort of touched uh, the places where performance is important, like the stuff that's happening every frame or, mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Um, yeah. But um, we do take out sort of sometimes we, we, we talk about it and then we, the others sort of do it as well. Yeah. Uh, but it's not sort of for me that's the default i don't think it's the default for for the others uh, yeah so yeah a, a question to carl like do, do you use uh, coroutines for other things than uh, io like for some custom uh, build things oh, yes. like you you mentioned like in the game engine of course you would use it for yeah. ai and physics and other things like do you have the same um, approach for your problems uh, do you think now in relation to android yeah, yeah. Uh, we use it for animations, I suppose, uh, for mm -hmm. making sure like some animation happens and then the next animation happens after the first one finishes. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, it's mostly related to uh, network calls. Mm -hmm. Mostly IO. And then animations is like, and state changes uh, over time is the other one. Yeah. So not, nothing kind of in the business logic that requires concurrency. You don't use that there. Um, we might use it, but in that case, I haven't uh, familiarized myself with it because there are a lot of files. OK. Yeah. Can I just ask, this is sort of a, side questions, a side question, but uh, I mean, at this when we're sort of doing coroutines in Unity, you quickly end up with sort of coroutines in a class that might modify that class variable and then sort of you get uh, essentially like race condition like behavior because you've sort of gone gotten yourself into an invalid state mm -hmm. uh, through a core routine while like another core routine is running. Do we have any good name for that? Because it, it's like it's it's it sort of acts a bit like a race condition, but it isn't sort of technically a race condition because that sort of has implied meaning of like threads and multiple cores. <laughs> but this is like a somewhat like a currency issue. Or I guess it's a concurrency issue, you but it's not one coroutine modifies the value, then the next one reads that value, and then the next one modifies it again. But you expect the second one to run before the other one, in a way. For instance, or like you modify one value, and then uh, you know you have a bug, so that you're supposed to modify two values, but you sort of yield before you modify the second one. All right. So and that's sort consistent of consistent state. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's a word, but uh, it probably can happen. I know we use mostly observable data types, so uh, so when you change something, nobody should read it unless they've observed it, and then they should act on the change right away. Yeah, yeah, because we don't have that in in Unity, so it, it's sort of uh, it's not uncommon for for that situation to to pop up <laughs> unless you unless you sort of pay real close attention to what's uh, like called the so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Coalition. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it now. Yeah, that sounds. I have another meeting soon, so uh, unless there's something else, uh, other questions aimed at me, I will depart. All right, guys, quick questions to Carl. And I will post the resource I mentioned uh, about the. Uh, a uh, corporate multitasker in this card probably just uh, later today. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, so thank you. Start. I'll see you. Yeah, thank you, Carl. Yeah, see thank you. you. See you. Um,